Rebuilding a rust-proof Land Rover, part 21. Originally, the brakes on the Land Rover were highly ineffective, using only inlet manifold vacuum connected to a small tank with a one-way valve feeding a brake servo unit. I never knew how much pressure to apply on the pedal, as the low vacuum was dependent on the engine revs. Once I fitted the Land Rover 90 disc brakes, I needed a proper belt-driven vacuum pump. And I found this one in a scrapyard. It was taken from a scrap Peugeot 405 car, and I was a bit dubious at first as to whether it would work, but in reality it's been incredibly successful. I fitted this vacuum pump to the Land Rover, and it was possibly the last job before I took it for an MOT, and the good news was everything was fine and it passed. I sold this Land Rover round about 2015 to a friend of mine who recently died, and if you've been following the series, you'll see why I'm still working on it. I bought the Land Rover from the estate of a friend of mine, the late Ken Rowley. I noticed when I got it back that Ken had modified it. He'd fitted a new diaphragm. Now, back in the day when I bought this, I went to a Peugeot dealer and they said, oh, no, we don't do any spare parts for it. You have to buy the complete unit. And it was incredibly expensive, so I didn't. Why is it in pieces on my workbench? Well, it has a bit of a problem, a serious problem. Initially, the vacuum dropped from 25 down to about 10, and the brakes worked, but they weren't very good. I took the unit apart to find this. It's a piece of rubberized fabric used as a diaphragm. It's not a standard part, it's something that my friend Ken fitted. Ken was an engineer, and he used to build British motorcycles and other things. Very shortly, I will show you what the problem is, but at this stage... Just before I took it apart, I didn't know what the problem was. I suspected the diaphragm, and the diaphragm, as I've just shown, was OK, so it must be the valves in the valve chest. Here I'm showing how the diaphragm is supported by two internal discs. This pump's quite clever. It's like a small engine in reverse. It has a crankshaft and a connecting rod. It connects to a trunk guide type crosshead, just like in a miniature steam locomotive. When I suspected it was the diaphragm, I did a bit of Googling, and I found that I could actually buy replacement diaphragms. That's progress for you. Because the first pump that I bought was a bit of a dud, and I couldn't get a replacement diaphragm for it. This appears to be made from some sort of rubber, and it's thicker than the diaphragm currently fitted. Before I got this far, though, I suspected the valves, so I took the top off the pump, and here it is. This pump is a bit of witchcraft, really. I looked at it, and I made the big mistake of not photographing it before I took it apart, so I could see which valve went where. It's not complicated, there are just two valves inside this little valve chest. One has a soft flap valve, and the other one has a metal flap valve. And this was clearly broken, it had cracked and broken in half. To make a new flap valve, I thought, shall I get a Stanley knife blade and grind it to the right size? No, I'll do it properly, I will machine a piece of stainless steel in the lathe and make my own flap valve. Here's the soft valve, and I don't think it's in the right place, as both of the housings are completely different. Anyway, I came to the conclusion that these valves have little pegs on the top of them, and these seem to act as guides for the supporting springs, which, when the top is tightened down, holds the valves very tightly in place. A view from the underside shows the nice and shiny, and definitely not broken, new metal flap valve that I made. I machined it from a piece of stainless steel bar, and to make sure that it was perfectly flat, I used my whetstone and ran it up and down the whetstone for a considerable time, and as you can see, it's very flat indeed. Here was the real problem. I didn't strip it down this far at first. I just fixed the valves, and it worked quite well for a while, but then it stopped working again and the second time I looked in more detail, this is what I found. The crosshead is broken. 
and this unit is definitely not designed to be taken apart. Besides, it's very old, I'm going to replace it with a new one, if I can find one. The first ones I looked at seemed very expensive and weren't quite right, and then I found one online, so I bought it. I like the serviceability. The Jubilee clip holds this plastic cap in place. Remove the clip, spring the cap out, and you can repack it with grease. But I never did that within the 26-year period since I rebuilt the Land Rover and fitted this. Before I figured what the real problem was, I bought some replacement valves. You can buy these now. There was a time you couldn't even buy any parts, except for a complete new pump from a Peugeot main dealer at an extortionate price. This piece of metal sets the position of the pump to tension the belt. I cleaned it up on the belt sander and I gave it a coat of etch primer. And the day after, I painted it black. And then this arrived in the post. Looking at it, I think this is a vacuum pump. Very carefully, I opened it to make sure it was what I wanted. I was pleased to see that it was very similar to the pump that I'd taken off the Land Rover. Slightly different in certain areas, but nothing that I can't put right. I'll be showing that in a future video, but that's it for this one. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.